Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. I'm delighted to be joined today by Frank LaRocca, the composer in residence of the Benedict XVI Institute and Professor Emeritus of Composition at California State University, East Bay. We discuss the trajectory of his compositional language and focus in his journey from his academic training at Yale and UC Berkeley, the music he wrote in that academic style for many years, and the spiritual and aesthetic conversion that undergirded his shift to what many of our listeners will know as his style in the masses he's been writing in recent years. This is an important episode for understanding the aesthetic relationship between what's being taught in American university composition departments and the needs of the church in compositions for today. I'm also delighted to announce that Frank is on our faculty this summer at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. He'll be leading a composition seminar for composers in short works for parish choirs. The course is limited to five students and takes place in person on the mornings of July 17th to the 21st at St. Patrick's Seminary here in Menlo Park, California. The application to the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music summer program will be up soon on our website, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. And there's an additional composition portfolio required for admission for this particular course. That same week, Dr. Christoph Tietze will be teaching an organ improvisation seminar limited to three students, and the auditioned 20 Voice Choral Institute will be led by Professor Christopher Berry and myself. It's going to be a great week. And even more than just these exciting courses that we're offering this summer is the exciting announcement that we are offering them for completely free tuition, accredited graduate level coursework for free tuition. So if you're interested in these or any of our other 12 courses, please check out our website for more information, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. And now on to our interview. Thank you for being here with me today, Frank. Oh, it's a real pleasure, Jenny. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you about all sorts of things, but I'm wondering if we could kind of take a a bird's eye view of the spiritual journey you've taken as a composer. Maybe we can start with where you spent most of your time in your academic career and what kind of music you were writing then and what your spiritual outlook on life was like then. And I'm thinking of, you know, before what we'll get to in in a sort of conversion story. Yes. Um, Well, I spent most of my academic career teaching students in bachelor's and master's programs at California State University in Hayward, which they call Cal State East Bay now, Uh, teaching a a really straightforward curriculum, uh, college music curriculum of harmony, counterpoint, form, analysis, and uh, composition lessons. When I first started teaching there, which was in 1981, I was probably at the peak of what I would call my hardcore academic phase as a composer, uh, which is a direct outgrowth of my own education and academic training at UC Berkeley, where most of the composition faculty members were graduates of Princeton. So they were either old school Roger Sessions type composers, or they were hardcore Milton Babbitt type composers. This didn't leave a lot of room for me for my own natural musical inclinations, which didn't uh, move in either of those directions. Uh, But by the time I got to graduate school, my guiding beacons for 20th century music were sort of mid-period Stravinsky and uh, the music of Béla Bartók, and maybe to a a lesser extent, uh, the music of George Crumb. Now, all of that is very far removed from 
where I am today. As my arm was twisted throughout grad school, stylistically speaking, there were a few years there where I decided to embrace the, the hard, really hardcore academic stuff, if only to show my teachers that I could do it and that I didn't prefer these other musics because they were somehow easier to execute. But by 1981, when I started teaching there, um, I had gotten my PhD and I discovered that without the either, uh, I don't know how you want to describe it, the support network or the uh, peer pressure of the grad school environment, I had very little commitment to that style of music. Um, but in having ad adopted it, I found that I had lost something that I couldn't, couldn't go back to. And so I spent uh, the next mm, six or seven years trying to uh, reconstruct uh, a musical voice. And what I landed on was something that was still very chromatic, but within it, I was, I was trying to draw out some sense of harmonic coherence. After that, with the, um, the dawning of, uh, in the mainstream of minimalism, and composers like Steve Reich and John Adams, I decided one day to say, oh, the heck with it. And I put a key signature on some score paper <laughs> and wrote a piece for two pianos uh, dedicated to my then four-year-old daughter, full of joy and life and energy and brimming with tonal coherence and contrast. And it was so powerfully satisfying to be unleashed in that way. I really never, from that point forward, this would have been 1991, turned my back on that. At this time, spiritually, I, what can I say? I was, I was lost. Um, even though I was baptized and confirmed in the Catholic Church, by the time I got to my undergraduate education, uh, I had stopped attending Mass. Bit by bit, I became a seeker in alternative explanations for the meaning of the universe. New Agey stuff. I mean, I was never into crystals or anything like that, but for anyone who knows the writings of Carlos Castaneda, deeply mystical, supposedly revealing the heart, at the, tr uh, the heart of truth at the core of the universe. That turned out to be a dead end, of course. And then I, I, I just, I spent years being uh, a nothing. And it really wasn't until my first child was born, my son, that uh, I, in part, out of a sense of obligation to him, made a really weak attempt at recapturing my Catholic beliefs. I, I didn't try very hard, and so it didn't work very well, but it did kind of put the Catholic Church back onto my mental map because he, and both he and, and my daughter, we sent them to Catholic schools their entire lives, which just meant being in touch with all of that again. Really, the um, the key moment for me was, I can still remember it because it was such a dramatic event, was in 1989. I was, I was in rehearsals for the premiere of what was, to that point, the most uh, substantial work I had ever composed, uh, a song cycle for tenor and chamber orchestra on poems of Theodore Rethke. And we had gotten to the third and final song, to the sort of big payoff, supposedly, that the whole rest of the piece was pointing towards. And it was an absolute dismal failure. It was just so utterly not the right thing <laughs> that uh, it, it, it's hard to imagine how I could have ever thought that that was going to work.
Are, are you talking here about the the performance or just like the, the feeling the that you had about, about your own composition? This was the next to last rehearsal. And, you know, in, in the way that, you know, a multi-movement work can be structured so that the preceding movements all kind of point towards a culminating moment in the final movement. Mahler's Second Symphony is one of the premier examples of that. I was putting this piece together in, in a similar way. And then when I got to the big payoff, it was a big nothing. It just did not have the dramatic and emotional power that I thought it was going to have. So this was on a Friday. The performance was uh, going to be the following Tuesday. There'd be one more rehearsal the next Monday, which meant that either I was going to have a great big turkey on my hands, or I would have to rewrite this all-important climax. Now, in those days, I was, well, I'm not, I don't consider, I've never considered myself a really fluent composer, except in really, you know, uh, a really simple tonal stuff that, you know, any competent musician can improvise. I was, I was never a fluent composer. I could go, it, it could take me a week, literally, to do four measures. And I had about 70 measures that I had to get done, that I had to think of to begin with. Then I had to get down on paper. And then because this is the days before music software, had to rewrite the score, rewrite all the parts, and essentially put the whole thing on the line. And I was keenly aware of all of this pressure and the, and the impending failure and humiliation. And for the first time in probably well over 20 years, I fell onto my knees and prayed. And I, I prayed a very straightforward prayer. I, I said, God, if you really are there, I need you and I need you now. And this is what I need. And uh, please help me. Yeah. And I got that music written I got it written in an astoundingly short period of time. It was exactly what needed to be there for the piece to culminate in the way that I had um, expected. And it was nothing like what I had thought it would be. So in all, in all those senses, I really believed I recognized a gift from God. And I was, I was never without some degree of serious religious commitment after that point. It may have wandered in different places. Um, for a while, I wandered into Protestant circles. I was very, very taken with a uh, evangelical charismatic service that a friend of mine invited me to um, and thought that this, this must be the truth because it, it produced great, exaggerated, emotional highs. Uh, the, the ceremonies were, were geared towards that. They were almost hypnotic um, in the way they unfolded. And then I settled down into a milder form of Presbyterianism before coming back to the Catholic Church in, in 2009. Before we go on to you talking about what, what this transformation meant in your compositional career, I have a, a question. Sure. Do, do you think that there are other composers out there who were following the same academic path that you were and felt the same sort of emptiness or like lack of freedom uh, in, in the aversion to tonality? Do you, do you think there are other people out there who um, have that experience, but maybe just didn't take the leap that you took? Uh, yes, uh, to both questions. Um, in fact, one of them, turned out to be my best friend in grad school. We were, uh, we were both rebels, uh, at least when we were by ourselves. Um, and, and, and for the same reason, because the, the music lacked, it lacked heart, it lacked expressive power, it was gray and uninvolving and I, to this day, I have never understood, you know, I mean, aside from the trends that emerged after World War II, 
you know, where uh, first in Europe and then here, there was a real turn in the arts against anything smacking of emotionalism or uh, representationalism um, because they, they somehow decided that's what got them into the two world wars. Of course they were wrong, but um, that, was, that was the analysis that was going around. And so what, what did we do instead? We, you know, we, we put on our lab coat and pull out our slide rule and treat music the same way we treat science, which of course was, was the branch of learning in those days that was gonna give us all the answers to the questions that um, religion and philosophy appeared not to have been able to in the preceding two millennia. Yeah, so it's it's interesting though, you know, I mean, Catholics listening to your story recognize that of course the strictures are where you find the freedom, right? you know, that commitment. I, I mean, we have that experience in the moral life and what you are experiencing is a sort of analog in the compositional life. Why do you think that is? I mean, if, if you had to explain that phenomenon to another composer who isn't uh, experiencing that freedom that you felt in um, reconnecting with tonality, what, what would you say as a, as a way of helping them open up that possibility? Well, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd want to see what kind of music they're composing now. Part, a, a good part of this has absolutely nothing to do with music but it has to do with a broader worldview. I recognize that in myself after the fact. Uh, the, the very first thing that began to, to kick me loose in graduate school was uh, a seminar where we had a, a visiting composer uh, from, from another university, Guy Knott, a recent, recent doctoral grad who was uh, coming to uh, to talk about his music, and in uh, directing that seminar was uh, the strongest exponent on the faculty of the um, of the sort of Milton Babbitt School of Composition, and something about Babbitt was brought up, and this guy responded. I, I don't even remember what he was responding to, but he used the words logical positivism. And I had no idea what that meant. But I knew <laughs> that he had some words to offer to push back against this thing, which I was incapable of pushing back against because what do you say? I don't like it. I mean, you can give all <laughs> kinds of subjective reasons for not wanting to do it but you can't necessarily persuade anybody with that. And here this guy comes out with these two words, logical positivism. And I have no idea what they mean. And so I ask him afterwards, I take him aside and I say, what does that mean? And he begins talking to me about, in essence, um, philosophy. Yeah. And I mean, my head just exploded. I said, philosophy? How do you mean, how does, how does, what does philosophy have to do with the arts? I suppose, you know, in the same way does, as what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem or something like that. Um, and, that and that's an interesting experience too, just because you know, you were talking about science and, and the Catholic looking at the scientific world sees the truth that is accessible through science, but also that scientists seem without philosophy to be incapable of recognizing the limits of what they can know. Stephen so, Hawking is, is one of the prime, prime examples of that. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's maybe just like a, a product of this academic approach to composition too, you know, that is really a very American thing. Yeah. Divorce from philosophy. You know, you don't you don't have to have a philosophy class to graduate with a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> right. And in in music, as um, as in science, there's science and then there's scientism. And science is wonderful and useful and can be shown to be objectively true or not. 
scientism, which is a philosophy, takes something beyond the boundaries of what it is of its explanatory powers. It takes science beyond the boundaries of its explanatory powers and begins to try to crowd out those things like philosophy, which do have those explanatory powers. And I think it was, there, were, there was something parallel to that in this extremely dry, mechanistic, academic music. It thought, well, if we can just have complete control over the manipulation of the musical materials, that means we have control over the music itself, as if the music were nothing more than the materials out of which it is made. Indeed, a sort of scientific corollary to materialism yeah, there yeah. too. Right? And music is not just the materials out of which it is made. It's, um, it's a language or even, or even the brain chemicals that it's, it stimulates. Maybe, maybe even well, the materialistic and, and response. Yes, right. right. And 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 music and music has a, a physiological component in the way that it uh, affects us. That that goes beyond what we can capture with analytical or or verbal um, descriptions. And so they they denied that realm of music. They denied the spirit. Uh, of music and focused simply on its letter. Right. And, well, it has led to a dead end. I, uh, I don't know hardly anybody who um, is still stuck in that particular realm. Uh, they may have gone off onto other tangents where they've gone beyond pitch and rhythm into overtone structure, you know, so-called spectral music where it's what's happening with you know the upper upper partials of the pitch combinations that are supposed to do something right um, I, i'm not really sure what they expect it to do but um, yeah you know i i am reminded of messian uh and just what you're saying you know and his uh fascination with overtones and he you know i think he kind of treated them in a, as a sort of oral halo in the same way that yes. when you're painting a, an icon, you have a halo around the saint, um, the halo of our Lord looks different. And so it seems like a way of reconnecting with reality, but uh, having a sort of numinal um, or numinous capacity. It's, it's a sort of, it seems to be a sort of spiritual striving, wouldn't you say? I, yes, uh, I do. And it's no, it's no surprise that somebody who was an organist would um, be inclined in that direction. I mean, look at what happens when you play with the overtones on an organ um, and how it transforms the sound. And also he, he would have been very, very keenly aware of the overtone structure um, of the music that he was playing on the organ and extended that into other realms such as uh, his his fascination with and especially masked mallet percussion because you talk about a dance of overtones yeah um, <laughs> in, a, in a musical in a musical texture it's the yeah. I mean the results of that are just um, extraordinary yeah can we use Messian to get back into your story here yeah. eventually you reconnect with your Catholic faith and well, well, it has I, a sort of a compositional corollary too right. It does. You know, people um, have often asked me how my return to the practice of uh, a Christian faith, how it affected my music. A and, it, and it did affect my music. But the reverse actually is also at least equally true. My search to be able to understand and articulate that thing that I first heard critiqued with the words logical positivism. That is the whole philosophical realm of, of aesthetics, the whole notion of transcendentals, goodness, truth, and beauty. As I stumbled along, I, I had nothing more than, than the most general familiarity with um, 
philosophy in my education to that point. As I stumbled along in my own way trying to sort these things out, it was because I wanted to have a path and a rationale for the music that, that, that I was composing in those days. And then when there was a, there was a, a kind of a crux that I reached where I was no longer concerned with having to justify it either to others or to myself, where I really believed in the rightness and the truth of composing in a tonal idiom. At that point, I found myself turning towards choral music. And this is linked with my uh, religious conversion because what I was trying to do was to work out a kind of journey of penance and grace in my musical pursuits, um, relying on the relatively limited technical means of unaccompanied voices and, and using scriptural texts as a springboard to explore my own desire to, to do penance for the many errors and the, the harm that I had done others during that period of my life where I, where I had no religious grounding. That did not, I was not yet Catholic, and so that music did not take the form of something typically that, that could work in, in liturgical settings. Um, in 2009, when I did return to the Catholic Church, finally, after 42 years since my last confession, I had the great good fortune to be at a parish that offered uh, the traditional Latin Mass. And I found myself in touch with a body of music with which I was deeply familiar from my years as a teacher of counterpoint. And that's, of course, the great Renaissance polyphonists. I'm embarrassed to admit, but I have to admit that during the years that I taught that music, taught the techniques of that music, I had next to no understanding of how it, fu of how it functioned in its um, native context. And so when I started assisting at Mass at St. Margaret Mary, we had a good enough scola that they could do the occasional uh, motet or polyphonic Mass. And I, re I reconnected with this music in its native soil. And that got me interested in trying to see what I could do composing music suitable specifically for the mass. Yeah. And that's what I've been focused on for the last, whatever that's been, 12 years or so. It's interesting that you you bring up this uh, reconnection with choral music, and I, I think you know um, anyone looking at the trends in modern composition sees that that um, there's a oh, yeah. there are a lot of people composing choral music now, and it it seems to be a sort of spiritual striving, just reconnecting with the body and the human voice in that way, in a way from you know um, it only orchestral or sort of electronic music. Do you think there is something to a spiritual sense or awakening or desire that people have and in, in heading in that direction? Oh, absolutely. And I count myself as among the many who have traveled that path. In my own case, it was not the Renaissance uh, polyphony that I taught for over three decades. In my own case, it was the music of Argo Pear. There, there was something both so familiar and so, in a good way, alien in that music that uh, attracted me to it powerfully and motivated me to try to understand it. And of course, the best way to understand something, at least in the initial stages, is to try to do it yourself. I mean, that's, you know, how did J.S. Bach begin his composing lessons? Well, his older brother gave him some Vivaldi and said, here, copy this. No, don't do anything else, just copy it. And of course, when he began to release more of his 
choral music, people began to see more clearly the in incredibly strong spiritual component to what he was doing. And Parrot became more and more forthcoming in describing his music and himself as spiritually seeking. There's something, yes, it, it has to do with the human voice and um, its very particular embodied beauty. It has to do with breath. It has to do with text also. I think there are quite a few people who have been attracted to that medium because uh, for, for reasons different than I'm describing for myself, they may say it's so spiritual, but, you know, it's spiritual in the sense of, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Yeah. Um, and there is a good deal of that kind of choral music out there, and it's very accessible to audiences, and it's very attractive to the ear, and it's very homophonic in texture, and it has these be this beautiful surface sheen to it. But if you know the composers themselves, and even if they're setting sacred music texts, I, I'm, I'm only talking about those cases in which I find myself um, put off by what, what they're trying to do. You, I, I find these composers trying to smuggle in the gravitas and great tradition, history, historical tradition of Catholic music, starting with chant, smuggle that into their pieces to kind of, you know, give it that cool sound that everybody likes. And they're, they're using it either to no purpose. It's a little bit un unhinged, right? Yeah, either, either, they're using it either to no purpose or actually to promote progressivist or woke agendas. Right. Um, yeah. Which me, is evil. It seems like it seems like that lack of the hinge is, you know, um, that spiritual but reli not religious attitudes where they're they're unable to commit to a, a concrete doctrine yeah. and remaining, you know, kind of aloof and and also just a, a lack of a commitment to liturgical use. And and it, you know, this is it reminds me of a, an article from 2003 by Taruskin called Sacred Entertainments, where he kind of critiques this, where it's kind of like the veneer of spirituality with exactly what you're talking about, but it's it's somehow unhinged or lacking the real depth. And so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, so many, um, you know, especially when I teach seminarians or amateur musicians are particularly attuned to when people are just making a living off of religion um, or making a living off of the church, but not personally invested in their faith, you know, and yeah. they'll ask questions like, okay, you know, can we hire musicians who aren't Catholic? Can we do the music of me people who aren't Catholic? And, you know, I think we can give that, that sort of glib answer where, you know, beauty in any place you find it, in a sense, yeah. belongs to the church, but there is something missing in what you're talking about in this modern compositional choral movement. Uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I know, a good number of Catholic musicians. And I see among them people responsible for liturgical service in their parishes who don't believe a word of what's being prayed there. I will say though that, that, that I also see, uh, aside from those who are clearly completely committed, mind, soul, and spirit, uh, to what they're doing musically, because it, it's an outgrowth of, of their own um, religious commitments. Uh, the small segment of people that I see, it, it's pretty clear they don't actually buy the whole thing, but they're not so ill-mannered that they publicly admit, you know, it's it's all just for show. There are people in all th in all three niches, maybe the most successful choral composer alive today, and I don't mean John Rutter. Um, I, mean Morton, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, Morton Lauritsen, who, you know, you, if you go to a 
choral music concert, and you hear his uh, some of his uh, very very beautiful compositions. They're really extremely well done. But I, I guess I have a pet peeve about probably the most popular piece of classical music from the last 50 years, which is his Omanu Mysterium. It's a lovely, lovely choral work. And I think it's utterly unsuitable for liturgical use. It's a lovely work, but it's a lovely work in the way that, and I can never remember this guy's name. There's this painter out there, I think he's deceased, but he produced hundreds of paintings of little cottages in the woods. Yes, uh, Thomas candlelight. Kincaid. Thomas Kincaid. <laughs> I really believe that Lauritsen's Omanu Mysterium is a Thomas Kincaid setting of that text. Right, and um, imitated by many, many people. And imitated by thousands of young wannabe composers in the decades since and really spawned the whole homophonic, close-spaced, multi-divisi, diatonic, clustery choral music that somebody like Eric Whitaker practices so successfully. I mean, some of that music is, is good. I mean, I like listening to, to it also, uh, particularly, I think, when I hear some of the composers in, in Great Britain who really know what they're doing when it comes to that stuff. But it, it, it's music that is not often wearing proper attire for liturgical use. Let's just put it that way. Right. So let's loop back into your compositional life now, especially since 2009. And um, maybe we can focus uh, specifically on the Mass of the Americas, uh, your recent Thanks. recording of which just debuted at number one on Billboard Classical Charts. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And I'm wondering, you know, perhaps some of our, our listeners know the story about the, the genesis of this through Archbishop Cordelione asking you and, and the Benedict the Sixteenth Institute, but... Could you talk a little bit about the piece itself and, and where you fit in this kind of constellation of compositional movements and people that we've been kind of talking about now yeah, and well, maybe how specifically your um, desire that it be usable in the liturgical context grounds your work? Oh, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> Archbishop Corleone, um, for those who don't know, had his first post as auxiliary bishop in San Diego, his hometown. And uh, one of the parishes he was uh, responsible for overseeing was the one at the very south, southern end of um, San Diego, right on the Mexican border. And so over the years, he, d he developed a, a great affection for his Spanish-speaking Mexican immigrant parishioners. He carried that affection with him when he was uh, appointed Archbishop of San Francisco to that body of, of worshipers and became involved in a longstanding tradition in San Francisco of an annual Guadalupana pilgrimage that takes place on the Saturday closest to Our Lady of Guadalupe's feast day and which involves a pilgrimage of multiple, multiple thousands of people through the streets of San Francisco, complete with all of the festive uh, adornments that they have retained from their memories of their Mexican home. I mean, people on horseback, dancers, Aztec dancers, that, that sort of thing. It's, it's a very elaborate, and a very deeply um, meaningful event, uh, especially to the Mexican American Catholics in San Francisco. In 2018, the Archbishop noticed that that Saturday of the Guadalupana pilgrimage coincided with the Feast of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, and he got it in his mind. The, and the, the Benedict Institute had just uh, kind of gotten off the ground with Maggie Gallagher as its executive director. The, the previous year, they had 
asked me if I would serve as composer in residence early in 2018. And then in May of that year, the Archbishop told me of this idea he had that he wanted to commission a mass that would somehow unify aspects of the celebrations of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and, and all that that in, entails for that, for that identity to the Blessed Mother with the aspects of the Guadalupana pilgrimage in Our Lady of Guadalupe to somehow find a, a way of getting these to coexist, to interpenetrate, to become unified in a way that might be expressed musically in a mass. Mass of the, that's how the idea for Mass of the Americas was born. Certainly one approach to that, hardly original on my part, um, that's been used by other composers throughout the centuries, is to incorporate some folk song or other traditional devotional music into the fabric of the music for the mass in such a way that it remains recognizable principally to those who already know it, but perhaps might even attract the attention and curiosity of those who don't already know it, but to not have it, to put it crudely, stick out like a sore thumb in the middle of the musical texture to make it seem as though it belongs there and that it belongs there as just yet one other manifestation of otherwise worthwhile, high, sacred music for the liturgy. Right. Um, and you asked me a whole bunch of other uh, questions. <laughs> so let me, let me follow up on that. Yeah, um, but you, you had a liturgical use in mind, right? I mean, I most, and, and, most and definitely and did. Of course, in this, uh, um, you know, this beautiful pa pa picture you painted for us of the sort of devotional atmosphere in which this mass would occur. Yes. And um, so did you feel, for example, like when you were thinking about time constraints, you know, about um, that you don't want the, the priest standing there for too long, you know, for the Sanctus mm -hmm. Benedictus, all those sorts of things. Um, did you find that that was a sort of element which helped you distill your ideas? That is a very insightful question. That is precisely what has to happen when you write liturgical music, is you have to distill your ideas to accommodate the realities of a, of a liturgical celebration and, and the, I mean, not that anybody's got us, you know, looking at a stopwatch. Well, but some people say, may be. <laughs> it, 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 it has to, it has to move naturally with the flow of other elements of the mass and it, it can't spend time gazing at its own navel, no matter how attractive it might be. So a further question then, I know you just did recently a, a parish a, a version, parish choir yeah. version of this mass. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the changes that you made uh, from the original full version. Um, you know, I, I think coming to this as a pianist, I think of like all the amazing uh, piano music that was written in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries for kids to play by Russian composers, oh, where yeah. it's just like such magical music and it understands their emotional world and understands how large their hands are, what things are interesting to them, especially to keep them practicing, you know, and it really was like a, it, it was a, a boon to their creativity and imagination. And um, when I think, you know, not being a choral composer here, obviously, I, when I think about, um, you know, those strictures here, even in terms of forces, you know, maybe not everyone experiences that as a sort of a springboard or a, I don't know. I mean, how, how was your experience with that? One of my favorite uh, pull quotes from uh, Igor Stravinsky is something to the effect of, I find nothing more inspiring than limitations. And when I first heard that as a graduate student, I went, what? I thought the whole idea is that uh, we're supposed to have access to completely unrestricted, untrammeled realms of imagination and- right. 
and and your and your audience member is your captive, and they got to sit there and listen to whatever it is. <laughs> It seems kind of like, a, a again, a, a parallel to the um, youthful ebullience approach to the moral life, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah but and sorry so, to interrupt. Li limita no, that's fine. I mean, lim limitations, you, that's, that's the negative connotation of what Stravinsky was talking about. What, what he really meant was a musical discipline. So that starting with the smallest germ of an idea and then letting that idea be the guiding principle as it unfolds of all other ideas in the piece, that narrows the range of choices, which is a good thing because I, I think that most, especially young composers are paralyzed, not by having an absence of choice in what they're doing, but by the seemingly unlimited realm of choice in what they can do. I, I think it helps focus and strengthen uh, a piece of music, no matter what the medium, whether it's uh, a, a Beethoven piano sonata or whether it's um, a communion motet. And by focusing on discipline, limitations, one arrives at a very concentrated essence. And if you can find the, the right essence for that text, for that moment in the liturgy, for the uh, ethos of the Catholic mass, then you have found um, a place where you can work um, as, as a composer. Because, yeah. you know, well, for all the reasons we've already said. Yeah. And that's, that's great. Some insights too, you know, for um, young composers to follow <laughs> in this sort of path that you're carving. I, I wonder if you might say a few words about um, your approach to tonality in this particular piece. You know, we kind of laid out the, the star uh, in the yes. constellation of Morton Lauritsen and that yeah. genre now, but where, where do you fall in that? Uh, well, I mean, I was seduced by Lordson the first time I heard O Manu Mysterium. Uh, I, I, what I found in it actually was not anything brand new. What I found in it was a kind of choral expression of a, what is sometimes still called pan-diatonicism that has its earliest roots, so far as I can tell, in Stravinsky's Pulcinella Suite, the transforming arrangements that Stravinsky was commissioned to do of Pergolesi's Pulcinella for a, a ballet. It, it's a really stunning landmark in Stravinsky's career because it, it follows on the heels of the Rite of Spring and um, and Les Nos, neither of which could, well, Les Nos maybe in, in certain respects with its modal Russian folk song uh, emphasis, neither of which could be um, mistaken for tonal music in, in any guise. But Pulcinella sounds like Baroque music, but well, with all these peculiar sonorities that find their way into it, notes that don't, so to speak, belong there, that are that but that have a, a diatonic relation to what's already going on they almost inject an, a new kind of vibrancy and, and life for a 20th century ear into a well understood uh, tonal idiom so i would say that my encounter first with uh, pulcinella which uh, i forgot for, for a great many years then later with um, pan-diatonicism of, of Lauritsen, and then the orthodox severity, if you will, of Arvo Pert. Uh, I, 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 I somehow digested these things into my, into my own natural instincts as a composer and have arrived at 
whatever it is I do now. I don't, I don't have a name for it. I, I could probably describe it to a composition student. If Would you um, say that it has programmatic uses of what you were talking about, that those excursions out of that ah. um, tonal realm for, for a, not, not a, you know, picture painting, that sort of thing. That's not yeah. what I'm talking about, yeah. but I'm talking about it's like liturgical hearing. Mm. Can you ask me that question again? I thought I understood it. Now I'm not sure I did. Yeah. Do do you go outside of um, the tonal world that you're kind of inhabiting for particular liturgical moments? A sort of liturgical program, programmaticism. Uh, I did that for Mass of the Americas um, in those places where mm. I'm trying to surround the tune like Guadalupana with harmonic raiment other than that by which it is known to most people, which is simple mariachi music. But that's, re that's really just a, a, t a technique of, of reharmonization. You know, you can take bum, 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 you can take that tune and harmonize it in the simplest dominant tonic context. Or I discovered, uh, among other things, you can take it through a kind of um, elaborate and interesting Baroque circle of fifths um, harmonic sequence. It remains recognizable melodically, but mm, that no no mariachi band ever played it that way. And uh, I mean, I myself had heard it and enjoyed it at uh, weddings of Mexican friends, never thinking that someday I'd be set with the task of um, transforming it into sacred liturgical uh, language. But as, as far as stretching boundaries or exploring fringes of my language in the tonal realm, I very consciously do that when the text that I'm setting, I believe, calls for it. I don't do it every time. You kind of neutralize your own music if you always treat the same kinds of situations in the same way every time. And so I'm kind of forced by my own desire not to just be repeating myself to say, well, okay, well, that worked that time, but what are you going to do this time? And, yeah. you know, a lot of it really comes down to polishing one's skills at incorporating dissonance and finding that liminal edge where it still works in the context of liturgy and doesn't like suddenly just break open a fourth wall and suddenly you're not think your your mind's taken away from the mass and you're thinking about the music instead like oh that was weird or oh I've never heard that before or whatever I mean liturgical music as you well know, uh, it, it's not supposed to distract you. It's supposed to more deeply immerse you in what's going on. And that that's, that can be um, a real fine balance to try to navigate. Yeah. Well, Frank, you know, I had a bunch of other questions about your other compositions and advice for young composers, but this has been so fascinating that what I think we just have to have you back on <laughs> and, be, and discuss those things uh, in a future episode. Sure. I, I, I'm really grateful for the sort of landscape uh, you uh, have painted for us just in, um, from the platform of your, your own story and your own voice, which is just really a, a gift to the church. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that, Jenny. I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, I might be happy to come back. You know, I, I spent close to 35 years teaching. I retired fully from academic life in uh, 2014. So it's been eight years since I've had a classroom full of students um, to pontificate for. <laughs> and <laughs> I think you may have uh, kind of tapped a nerve here. I'm, I'm very glad to have done so. Too long. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Sure. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website 
at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.